uh, my name is Kamish Kunti. Thank you very much for the kind introductions again. And sorry I can't be with you, but I'm wishing you a great conference. Um, I've been asked to talk about care of people with diabetes post COVID 19 in primary care. These are my disclosures. Uh, over the next few minutes, I'd like to take you through uh, background to COVID 19, uh, some of the guideline recommendations and therapies, and then um, into the future management of people with diabetes, and then summarize. In terms of background, we all know uh, diabetes is one of the most significant public health challenges. Um, these are just data for the UK, which I think go across the whole world in terms of the high prevalence, the number of people uh, with diabetes that are uh, cared for in primary care. We're in the UK, 90% are cared for in, in, in primary care. And the cost of hospital admissions is huge, particularly complications such as amputations. And if we can reduce these, um, then the cost obviously would be reduced dramatically. Costs in terms of uh, medications are only a few. We think type 2 diabetes is a disease of the older population, but now we're seeing more and more people with diabetes. And uh, in people who get diabetes in the early age of onset have a lot more uh, long-term com complications and obviously reduces productivity for people uh, to the country as well. In terms of COVID-19, um, A.K. Singh and uh, ourselves did a meta-analysis, um, a very comprehensive meta-analysis of 18 studies with over 14,000 individuals. And we see that diabetes is highly prevalent in people who are admitted with COVID-19 and who also have worse outcomes as well, so severe COVID-19. Hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and CKD, some of the commonest conditions. Um, if we look at an uh, estimated pool for severe COVID, this is intensive care or mortality, and there's been other um, meta-analysis showing this, we see that hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, CKD, are associated with a two to fourfold increased risk of severe COVID. And we know all these conditions uh, occur at the same time, so a lot of comorbidities in people with diabetes as well. And you can see this here in this uh, um, study that Yogini from my group did, that uh, people who had uh, positive for COVID, 78% of those with diabetes also had hypertension. Um, and so comorbidity is a major issue, and comorbidity leads to worse outcomes as well. Um, we had some of the most comprehensive data that have been published from the UK in this study. We looked at 71 million, 61 million people in England and uh, compared the risk of mortality uh, against uh, the background population. And what we see is in people with type 1 diabetes, there was a threefold increased risk of in hospital death. And people with type 2 diabetes, there's a twofold increased risk of hospital death. But uh, if you look at the left-hand side, in terms of particularly type 1, the risk is very low in young people and uh, seems to increase um, from the age of around 50. In terms of guidelines, there's been a number of guidelines. These are the first ones that came out, and I was fortunate enough to be part of this international group. And uh, we've had a, a plethora of guidelines, uh, mainly consensus guidelines, telling us what we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing in people with diabetes, either in the community or once they are admitted to hospital. And this study, uh, sorry, this guideline mentioned about all the different uh, therapies that we should be using, and also in terms of how outpatient care should be managed, inpatient care should be managed, and therapeutic aims as well. And there was caution uh, recommendations in this saying premature discontinuation was established therapy shouldn't occur, unless obviously patients are admitted to hospital Consensus recommendations say that metformin and DPP, um, metformin and SGLT2 inhibitors should be stopped. In terms of therapies, there's been again a number of studies. Uh, this is a meta analysis of five studies looking at the mortality risk uh, with pre admission metformin. And we see there's about a 38% more overall reduced risk uh, in people who had metformin prior to admission. And this has been shown in a, in a number of studies as well. However, there may be reasons for this because uh, metformin, we start very early on, we stop it if people have a low EGFR, 
Um, other therapies we may have choose to start at, at a certain time in point. So this is the most comprehensive study that uh, we conducted using um, the English data uh, on over um, 2.5 million people. And what we see in this is that overall, there are slight increases in risk uh, of COVID-19 mortality and some low uh, risk. And what we see again consistently, metformin, uh, a low risk of around uh, 23%, slightly increased with DPP-4 inhibitor, much higher increased risk, 42% higher risk with insulin. But we see this again with every study. Insulin is started very late on when people have complications, they've had diabetes for long duration. Um, so previous studies have also shown uh, against any other therapy, you will have a higher risk of mortality with insulin. But if you look at absolute numbers, for example, in DPP-4 inhibitor, 8.5 per thousand against 9.1 per thousand, the, the risks are very, very low. And our conclusions here were really that Overall, it's most likely because of uh, prescription by indication, and there doesn't seem to be any signals here for us to uh, stop any therapies, and we should be continuing as per normal. We also uh, start, did stratified analysis by age, sex, uh, cardiovascular disease, and EGFR for metformin and insulin, and you can see consistent results in terms of the hazards ratios. The only way we can tell about uh, which therapy is uh, beneficial or harmful in uh, people with COVID is by randomized control trials. <clears throat> and there are a number of randomized control trials that are ongoing for DPP-4 inhibitors, metformin, pyoglitazone, SGLT2 inhibitor, and GLP-1 receptor agonist. Um, I'll just take you through one which has recently been published by uh, my good friend uh, Mikhail Kossibord on the SGLT2 inhibitor with Dapiglosin, the DARE trial. And it certainly was a DARE trial because they initiated therapy in people admitted to hospital with COVID. As you know, they have worse outcomes. And they had a primary outcome of new or worsened respiratory, uh, cardiovascular or kidney organ dysfunction or death from any cause. And then separate uh, components of it as well as secondary outcomes. And what we see here, it didn't meet its primary outcome, 20% uh, reduction in primary outcome, which was not significant and for all the other components, uh, they again are all on the right side of uh, favoring rapid closing, uh, but not significant. Um, so we certainly are not doing harm and we may be doing benefits. If you look at the safety outcomes, uh, we see that overall again no signal. Um, the number of people with surgeries are, are adverse events were numerically higher in people on the placebo drug. Um, same with the uh, discontinuation numerically higher. If we look at acute kidney injury, numerically higher in people on placebo, lower in uh, people with acute kidney injury, and only two cases of diabetic ketoacidosis on the 50 or so percent who had diabetes in the cohort. And here, uh, there it was only uh, identified because these people were being monitored regularly and when um, the uh, therapy was stopped, after the closing was stopped and they were properly managed uh, patients made a full recovery. So now on to future management. Um, we've had a disruption, and this is a really nice master's publication, uh, which I haven't seen a, a, a paper publication. But uh, this is a really good thesis published in 2016 that any natural disaster, which COVID is, would give you these type of uh, consequences. So earthquakes, cyclones, extreme temperatures, hurricanes, tsunami, volcanoes, landslides, floods, etc., has disruptions to the public health infrastructures and disruptions to the environment and the individual as Hello. well. Uh, there's been disruptions for individuals in terms of uh, they haven't had um, therapies, they've been isolating, not exercising, increased mental health problems. In terms of institutions, they haven't had face-to-face -face consultations, they haven't been able to go out, uh, some not been able to go to hospital uh, for their routine care, and even emergency cares have been stopped. And so once treatment and care stops, you get worse outcomes in terms of diabetes and other non-chronic um, diseases, and you get the exacerbation of the index condition here, for example, diabetes. We see worse diabetes control, high blood pressure, impaired glucose tolerance, and increased complications. And this has been seen in other uh, previous natural disasters, such as after Hurricane Katrina, uh, risk factor control was worse, and after uh, certain disasters, we have had increased 
risk of harder outcomes as well. In, in terms of uh, which conditions have been disrupted the most, this is again your guinea from our group showing that diabetes is the condition that most people uh, in this global survey said had been most impacted due to COVID-19. If we look at the two most common conditions, it's again diabetes and hypertension, which you showed earlier, uh, putting people at risk of severe uh, COVID as well. This is data from the UK. Um, we're very fortunate in the UK having some excellent data. And this was looking at routine primary care data. Uh, because of disruptions, diabetic emergency consultations have been reduced, depression consultations have been reduced in primary care. This is looking at in the yellow or the orange line, the 2020 data, and the blue line, the average uh, of 2017 to 19. So disruptions certainly have had uh, indirect acute effects uh, on the physical and mental health of people uh, in, in various countries. And we know from previous work that we've done and others have done that uh, even a short delay in glycemic targets leads to worse outcomes. So on the left-hand side, St. Joy Paul and I did a study where we said uh, just a one-year delay of poor glycemic control in people with type 2 diabetes is, is associated with a significant increase in myocardial infarction, heart failure, stroke, and composite cardiovascular events. On the right-hand side, other data have shown that short delays will lead to nephropathy, neuropathy, retinopathy, and US data have also shown that uh, as short delays will lead to increased mortality as well. We've had disruptions for 18 months and they're continuing. And so people's risk factor, if they're not controlled, we are going to see in the medium term significant risk of macrovascular complications, microvascular complications, and mortality as well. The other area of uh, interest is new onset diabetes. Now, we don't know whether this is a, a uh, a real or uh, whether uh, this is something that we've seen in previous uh, acute admissions. This is a systematic review and meta-analysis that was published recently uh, last year showing that there was a 14% increase in new onset diabetes and people were admitted. But there are lots of caveats, lots uh, of uh, uh, issues with these studies because none of them had uh, HbA1c on admission uh, or very few and these patients weren't followed up. So we don't know whether this is transient. There is a, a global new diabetes uh, registry, which we've set up with Francesco Rubino, and we should be looking at the data soon. Um, and uh, thank you to people in India who contributed hugely to this as well. In terms of the potential mechanisms of new onset diabetes, uh, uh, this is possibly due to stress hyperglycemia. We've seen this in um, previous uh, uh, admissions, such as uh, myocardial infarction, there could be uh, pre-existing diabetes that wasn't picked up and patients are admitted and we see higher risk uh, when um, people are screened because their glucose is high on admission. It could be due to in-hospital steroid-induced diabetes, which may or may not be transient. And finally, this interesting concept that SARS-CoV-2 binds to ACE2 receptors in pancreatic uh, islet cells and uh, there may be beta cell destruction leading to uh, new onset diabetes. There are a number of studies that are ongoing. We're doing some and others, uh, but I'm not sure whether we will get to the bottom of this completely. We've shown in this study of people who were admitted to hospital uh, and then discharged, we know a high proportion of people die, but even after discharge, at 140 days, 30% were readmitted and 12% had died. And we compared the population of COVID cases with control group in previous years. And what we see is new onset diabetes on the left hand side is certainly increased. This is rates per thousand patient years. We also see increases in um, major cardiovascular events, CKD and chronic liver disease as well. In terms of disruptions to uh, diabetes services, as I mentioned, there's been seat shielding and isolation, particularly of clinically vulnerable groups, social distancing measures, suspension of routine appointments and redeployment of staff. Um, we've seen uh, from data in previous disasters and, and even during COVID, the HPA readings have risen significantly during lockdown. And there's been late uh, uh, clinical presentations for some complications uh, to admission because of fears of exposure to COVID-19 or difficulty in accessing clinical services. 
And what we need to do now is really, uh, and it's, it is a major ch challenge for every country, is making up for lost time. Uh, and it may take um, six months, 12 months, or even lo longer to uh, overcome this significant backlog that we've had. Um, UK data have shown that overall uh, diagnosis for type 2 diabetes were down about 70% during uh, the pandemic. Uh, during the first national lockdown, HbA1c testing uh, for type, people with type 2 diabetes was reduced by about 77 to 84%. Um, aid care processes, you know, having people's eyes checked, feet checked, etc., were down from about 60% to 19%. And so catching up in this backlog is going to be a major, major challenge. A um, number of uh, societies have given guidelines. This is a uh, primary care uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. society yeah, yeah, yeah. in the uh, UK uh, that we should have proactive uh, patient engagement, education support to tackle this therapeutic inertia. Uh, we may be continuing telemonitoring and remote consultations, but we really need to have these consultations. Um, we need to get an information on their weight, blood pressure, um, blood glucose levels if they're doing it at home. And I think we really need to start bringing people in and starting uh, looking at their risk factor control. We need to set up reminder systems, computer uh, decision-based systems to see which patients may be at the highest risk and also supporting uh, self-management programs. Uh, communications between healthcare professionals, patients, family members and caregivers Givers is really, really of utmost importance. We need to communicate to the patients about the uh, progression of type 2 diabetes and how they need to adjust treatments, education and training of diabetes self-management uh, of, of patients, signposting people for self-help groups, tackling non-adherence, which has occurred and which has, does occur when you, know, you have acute Im emergencies and minimizing adverse events, and informing family and members to help motivate patients as well. Uh, a number of risk stratification tools have been uh, developed. This is uh, looking at uh, red, amber, or green. Uh, if patients have a uh, high blood pressure, high HbA1c, diabetes complications, CKD, um, cardiovascular disease, high BMI. These are red uh, in certain areas. Uh, we should be prioritizing to see them. But if people have two ambers, for example, they also should be prioritized. And we've then uh, red is and see them in three months, amber in six months, and green within 12 months uh, for routine appointment. We know poor glycemic control leads to worse outcomes. This was uh, one of the first studies uh, looking at people who were well controlled against poorly controlled. I mean, in people who uh, were well controlled, they had about a 86% reduced risk of all cause mortality, uh, about a 50% uh, reduction in acute respiratory distress syndrome, and also significant uh, reduction in acute kidney injury and acute heart injury as well. We know um, HbA1c control uh, is associated with worse outcomes, so we, even in people who haven't had uh, uh, COVID-19, uh, we need to ensure that the HbA1c is controlled, uh, more so in type 2 diabetes. This is a data we looked at for the again, whole population. Uh, 2.8 million people with type 2 diabetes, um, uh, 264,000 people with type 1 diabetes. HbA1c control was associated with, with worse outcomes with an HbA1c of greater than 10% in people with type 1 diabetes. Uh, but for type 2 diabetes, as you can see, gradual increase, uh, linear increase uh, with an HbA1c greater than 7.5%. So we need to make sure that they are all well controlled. We have an interest in ethnic minority, and we know ethnic minorities have worse outcomes. And this is again our data showing people with type 1 and type 2 diabetes, ethnic minorities uh, had worse outcomes in terms of mortality compared to white uh, people. And uh, obviously in India, these people are at much, much higher risk. So we need to ensure that they are well managed. Obesity is a major risk factor. This is Sam Saidu from our group that conducted a meta-analysis showing that increased risk of severe illness and mortality, and we need to manage more, more, um, uh, BMI. We know during pandemic there have been two to three kilogram increase in weight for uh, many people, and that we need to really manage. This is uh, data from us again showing that BMI in both type 1 and type 2 diabetes is associated with what were that worse outcomes, so definitely something we need to uh, ensure we're managing in a primary care setting. EGFR, people with 
worst uh, EGFR have worse outcomes. Uh, again, this is data from us looking at mortality. Um, there are now therapies to manage people with uh, an EGFR to ensure that it doesn't get worse. In fact, it gets better. So we need to um, ensure that they are on those right therapies. People with cardiovascular disease have worse outcomes if they have COVID-19. We need to ensure that they have risk factors managed as well. So coming now finally onto um, how we manage, uh, we've got the ADA ESD consensus report and on the left hand side people with established cardiovascular disease or if they have CKD or heart failure predominating we should be starting on SGLT2 inhibitors uh, and uh, for arthrostatic cardiovascular disease GLP-1 receptor agonist um, we've got areas for minimizing hypoglycemia, people with uh, 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 weight problems, we need to ensure that we're not using therapies that increase their weight uh, and uh, preferably using uh, therapies such as GLP-1 receptor agonists or SGL to do inhibitors which reduce weight, but we need to take cost into account as well. Um, whether the newer therapies uh, lead to better outcomes, we don't know. This is uh, There are potential mechanisms and benefits of uh, certainly multiple risk factor um, control which have been shown before. Most people with COVID-19 uh, and without COVID-19 during the pandemic have had worse outcomes in terms of their intermediate outcomes, blood pressure, cholesterol, HbA1c, and we need to control those risk factors with whatever way possible. People with uh, who've had COVID are high cardiovascular risk, as I showed you, you know, um, they are readmitted with uh, cardiovascular events. Whether we should be using these newer therapies for these patients, we don't know. Uh, we have to uh, wait and see if there are uh, such trials. Uh, so in summary, it's unclear if people with diabetes are more likely to contract COVID-19. Current data suggests that COVID-19 is associated with worse outcomes in people with diabetes. And blood glucose is associated with worse outcomes, so we need to ensure we, need, we get uh, patients to control. Uh, and uh, it's not just people with COVID who will have worse outcomes. Disruptions in routine care will have indirect effects on these people. We need to uh, make sure we manage them. So we need to start the inpatient services normal, continue the outpatient services, the urgent acute care, continue routine diabetes care, as we've said, food services, pregnancy services, uh, retinopathy screening. Uh, we need to start doing blood tests on these people uh, and follow up patients who may have new onset or long COVID and ensure everyone uh, uh, with diabetes and their carers are vaccinated uh, against COVID-19. Thank you very much for listening.